welcome to Out of the Ether with Brandon Hardy. This is the first episode of my new monthly series. I'm an artist and designer who spent more than a decade working on Broadway, television, and themed entertainment around the world. Those of you familiar with my work may have noticed I have a taste for making strange and unusual projects. Early in the pandemic, I took to TikTok, making videos of the work that I was creating while my industries were shut down, but also making videos showing how I was building those projects to help people find their creative outlet during a difficult time. Over half a million people followed along on that journey, and a lot of people started to ask if I would ever make longer form tutorials. And just as I was developing the interest, the infrastructure, and the confidence to try something like that, my home and studio were The point is, I have to rebuild my life from scratch. And since I'm starting over, I thought I'd make that the basis for the start of my new show. Some things you should know. My intention is for this to be an open-ended series with a new episode every month featuring all different kinds of spooky projects. Halloween is almost upon us! But today, I'm starting where I stand and showing you the process of how I'm starting to rebuild my creative life. All the episodes of the show will be available on Patreon, but occasionally some episodes will be available on YouTube like this one. I want to keep this show as accessible as possible, but it does take some support to be able to put together something like this. So if you find yourself enjoying this episode, I hope you'll consider becoming a patron, and then I can share with you all of my specialized knowledge and we can grow our creative light together. With that said, together my new space, one of the first things I knew I wanted was a really great antique desk. And thankfully, I didn't have to look very far before I found one that I totally fell in love with. I found this one for $20 on Craigslist. I'm always surprised by some of the great things that you can find there, and I make a habit of checking the free section in particular for total oddities. In my travels, I've been keeping an eye out for what I consider supremely haunted-looking objects. As you can see, this is a great example. I'm not even sure I could tell you what it actually is, but this and all these funny little pieces that I found seemed really great to sort of outfit my desk and make it feel extra spooky. The best is when you find something that fits your aesthetic, but also can serve a function. So I'm gonna use this funny little urn to store pens and small tools. Because I am a human being in the year 2022, I do have some functional pieces that don't necessarily fit my aesthetic. So in cases like that, what I like to do is either make a project out of turning them into something that fits the vibe, or I'll just kind of simply disguise them in other things that do fit the vibe. I have a feeling this book stand is going to be rendered practically useless, not because I don't ever read, but just because I love the look of it so much that I don't know that I ever want to block it with a book. Also, I do have to take a second to point out these scissors. These were a gift from one of my very best friends, and I am so, so in love with them. I do have a great bookshelf project planned, but that's gonna have to wait until after Halloween. I got very lucky when I was on the hunt for a chair for this desk. I found this one on Facebook Marketplace for $5. It is a fully hand-carved wooden chair. Truth be told, it is not the most comfortable thing in the world to actually sit on, but I bet I can find a way to fix that without ruining the look of it. Of course, this would not be a proper artist's workspace if I didn't have some illumination to help see what I'm actually working on. I found two of these lamps at two different thrift stores, actually. They're not identical twins, but something that I really love is virtual symmetry. So to make them a little more similar, I covered all the lights with these antique replica flame shades. 
And then, of course, I did my best to outfit the space with spooky objects in every corner. So now, after a long time, I have the beginnings of a space where I can once again start to develop new creative projects. Visible horizon, silent, placid dark, so quiet you hear everything. And a darkness like drowning, the agonizing howl that screams down your throat. One is large, looming, too big to comprehend, the other, the other is too. Like the difference between shutting your eyes and staring into the void. Only to tell the difference is whether you are in it or it's in you. You have to watch them. I have to stay quiet. I can't make a sound. This place isn't what it looks like. It knows what it's doing. It's listening. The walls aren't where they're supposed to be. Trick you. This is where I looked into the mouth of hell and felt its breath upon my neck. This place, this place, I don't even want to think. There has to be a way to get out. As of my work in theater, one of the things that I'm always keeping an eye out for are great fake candles. Even at the professional level, a lot of the time you're not allowed to use an open flame. I recently discovered these candles by Jen Swin, and they are some of the best fake candles I've ever seen. They're battery powered, they come with a little remote that lets you adjust the brightness and settings and of course turn them on and off. And one of the best attributes is that they are covered in real wax, which means it's extremely easy to make them look very spooky. All I'm doing here is taking my regular hot glue gun and using the heated tip to melt the wax around the rim of these candles. You may notice my finger is not even on the trigger of this glue gun. I am not using it as a glue gun. I am just using it as essentially a heat tool to strategically melt the wax around the top of the candle and create lots of drips. Straight out of the box, these candles look a little too perfect and don't look like they've been burning for a while. So I wanted to take things a little bit further and add that extra bit of realism to these already great looking fake candles. Something that I'm making sure to do is dig out around the wick because real candles, when they burn, always sort of crater at the point that's closest to the flame. After I do that, I give it a quick pass with a heat gun just to sort of take off any sharp edges and really make it look like it's been melting. A hairdryer would work as well. If I were using these on stage, I might skip this step just because from a distance I don't think anybody would notice, but since I plan on having these seen close up, I think it's worth doing. Once the wax is dried, I go down the line and give the top of each candle a shot with a gloss clear coat. This makes the wax in the craters at the top look shiny and melted. And just a reminder, these are fake candles. Don't ever spray an aerosol around an actual flame. When I go to set these up, I make sure the faux flame and the candle itself are sitting upright. When they don't want to stand upright in their holder, I just mash a piece of sticky tack on the side, and that usually works. You may be wondering why I didn't just pour new wax down the side of these candles, but honestly, it takes longer and it never seems to work as well, so this is the process I've found works best. If you decide to try it and it doesn't work, you can use your heat gun or hairdryer to fix the mess. 
You may also be wondering, why not just use the heat gun? But it heats things too evenly, so you don't get the distinctive drips of a real candle. Because all the steps in this project are so simple, it's really easy to just go down the line and knock out a whole bunch of candles at once. If you go to try something like this, just be aware the likelihood is high that you will get wax on yourself or your workspace at some point. So if you're using a low temperature glue gun, it's not gonna hurt. It just might surprise you. All the candelabras that I'm using here came from thrift stores and garage sales. Usually they were only a couple bucks a piece because they tend to be older and more beat up, which makes them less appealing to other people, but extra appealing to me. As long as they're not totally gross, I tend to prefer to leave them looking tarnished and spooky. I have to find the world again. I feel so far away. The light, it's drawing me. Is it drawing me any closer? I feel like a small creature, swallowed whole by a monster. One I've been inside before. Its skin has changed, but the bones are the same. This is the skeleton of the creature that tried to kill me. I'm inside the belly of the beast, hoping it doesn't wake up. I hardly remember what it looked like before, and yet I'm always reminded. For this next project, I was inspired by some of the chandeliers that hang in the haunted mansion. I wanted an antique chandelier in this style that I could hang in my space, but since I couldn't find one in my price range, I found this one for 25 bucks at a thrift store and decided it was close enough that I could take it the rest of the way. I started by using these silicone molds that I found at Michael's to mix in filigree so that the chandelier wouldn't look so contemporary. I'm using black hot glue to fill the wells of the mold. Black hot glue is one of my favorite secret weapons to use for theater and spooky projects. Most people don't think of it this way, but hot glue is a thermoplastic. Part of what's nice is you can use hot glue directly in a silicone mold like this without any mold release, and when it's cooled, it'll just pull right out. Because this is an impression mold, when I pull a piece of filigree out of it, it will only represent one half of a finished piece. What I'll do is I'll take the mirrored half on the other side of the mold and glue the two pieces together to create something that's fully three-dimensional and looks good from every side. Ultimately, I ended up needing about 30 pieces of finished filigree to achieve the design that I wanted for the chandelier, so I made 60 molds and then glued all those halves together to get my 30 pieces. I also made some additional molds of different designs to round things out. When it came time to attach them to the chandelier, I just used my trusty black hot glue gun. Side note, if you ever use different colors of hot glue, I recommend you get a glue gun specifically for that color. That way you don't end up with a tie-dye effect out of your hot glue gun. Although that sounds cool, and maybe worth a try. Hot glue works surprisingly well to stick these things on the chandelier because the cool metal kind of zaps the glue and makes it freeze immediately. Once everything was in place the way I liked, I took the whole chandelier outside and gave it a coat of Montana Black brand gold spray paint. I'm sure that sounds confusing, but it's gold spray paint made by Montana Black. I sprayed the entire chandelier, even though a lot of it was already gold, just so that the golds all matched. Once that was dry, I went in with some walnut wood tone spray by Design Master to just sort of give things a little bit of an antique look. It can be easy to overdo it on a step like this, but if that happens, you can just go back in with the Montana Black gold spray paint and essentially erase some of it. When that was all cured, I used this chalky finish gray spray paint and gave everything a light spray to create a dust effect. This is another step where it can very easily get away from you, so if that happens, same thing as before, just go back in and essentially erase it with your other colors. As you may be able to tell by the fact that I am still spray painting this, I am speaking from experience. It got away from me. Now, a chandelier that is made mostly out of hot glue should never use a bulb that gets hot. I found these flicker flame bulbs at Lowe's that have a great flame effect, but never actually produce any heat. Ultimately, I wanted the look of an antique gas-powered chandelier, and I liked the light these guys were giving off, but I realized I had another trick up my sleeve that could take things even further.
Sun can't still be out there. No, I to stop thinking so much. I don't like my thoughts straight. Maybe it's just the colors. Maybe the clouds are too. There's nothing here. See, the clouds are different here. The clouds don't work the same way. What if the different than there are probably just too many clouds. I know how clouds work. I found this beautiful electric hurricane lamp on Craigslist for just a couple bucks. I really mean it when I say that if you use good judgment, there's a surprising amount of good stuff on Craigslist. One of the things I wanted to do to make things really extra special was make all the lighting in the space customizable. To do this, I'm using Philips Hue smart bulbs in a couple different fixtures around my space. Part of what I love about this lamp is that it is a genuine antique that somebody went back and retrofitted to be an electric lamp. You'll see that one of my favorite things is to work with objects that are more than what they seem. To control the Philips Hue bulbs via Wi-Fi, you do need a Philips Hue bridge that goes right into your router, so make sure you pick that up if you pick up some of these bulbs. Through the native Philips Hue app, I'm able to customize the brightness and color of any of my bulbs straight from my smartphone. Some of the newer generation Philips Hue bulbs have the ability to run fireplace and candle settings, which gives you a great antique look straight from the native app. Outside of the native Philips Hue app, one of my favorite apps to control these lights is called OnSwitch. It's a low price subscription based app that has tons of different programs and settings. I promise you they're not paying me to tell you this, they don't know who I am, I just like their app. I have some plans to use some of these settings in future projects, but they also have just like great normal settings if you're into that. Some of the scenes are really hyperactive and kinetic, but there are some really great relaxing ones as well. Personally, my favorite thing about this is that it gives me the ability to conjure up a thunderstorm anytime I want. Get out. You have to go. Get out. Hold your breath. Hold your breath. And it can't get in. It can't get you. Unless its tendrils reach inside, clawing its way. What is this? What is it? in my head? What if it's not what I think it is? It's hard to trust anything that moves like that. That moves the same way as the smell. What about the smell? That smell of evil. I know what it smells like. Does this smell like... No. No, it's a trick. It's found me, but it can't get me if I just hold my breath. (sighs) 
I mentioned earlier that I had some plans for the bulbs in my chandelier. I realized there was a really good trick that I could do with the Philips Hue candelabra bulbs. Here are those scissors again, aren't they the best? So the way that a lot of gas chandeliers work is that they have a little mantle instead of an actual bulb. And what it is, is like a tiny knitted radioactive sock. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm pretty sure I'm actually right. The point is, I realized I could replicate the look of that if I cut some fingers off of these knitted gloves and stretched them over the bulbs and stitched them in place. I promise if you stick around, this will be the greatest faux radioactive sock tutorial you will see this week. Ultimately, it's very simple. I'm just cutting them to size and stitching them on the bulbs so they won't slip off. These bulbs are also LED and they produce practically no warmth, so they're not going to cause any trouble down the line. Just to be extra careful, I'm making sure that I only stitch them about halfway up the bulb. That way there's just no chance that anything will ever come into contact with the socket. And speaking of sockets, the only Philips Hue bulb that is the right shape for this effect is the wrong size for the sockets in my chandelier. So I'm using these adapters to make them fit properly. Just as a general rule of thumb, if you're ever putting in light bulbs, make sure that the power to the device is completely cut before you screw something in. Once they're all screwed in, you can turn the power back on. And because these are now Philips Hue bulbs, I can have some fun with the settings. Like I said before, they have a built-in candle setting, so now I can have the gas lamp look whenever I want, but I can also change things up entirely. Now to really put the chandelier over the top, I'm taking some black thread and gluing it in strands across the chandelier. This is going to give me a framework to help spray fake cobwebs on it. My preferred method for fake cobwebs is Loctite spray adhesive. They make a couple different styles, so look for the one that says web on the front. I always pick the nozzle before I spray to make sure that I clear away any gunk that's collected, and I always do a test spray on a piece of scrap to make sure the web is coming out nice and clean. If the nozzle isn't properly clean, it might send out the web in crazy directions and make a mess. I also always make sure to hold a piece of scrap behind whatever it is I'm spraying, so I don't overspray and get what's essentially a bunch of contact cement on other stuff. Another part of what's good about doing a test spray is you can sort of get a feel for how the web is falling naturally and how far away you should hold your can when you're spraying something with cobwebs. Once you're feeling good about how it's going, it's just a matter of webbing to your personal taste. When the webs have dried, they're a little bit brittle, which is nice because you can pull away parts that maybe you did too much, or you can poke holes in some spaces that you feel are too dense.
So this is where I'm starting. Truth be told, this is not exactly where I want to be. But at least now, it's a place where I can start making things for real again. If this is where I'm going to be, I want to make it feel like home. The old definition of home isn't going to work. So I'm going to create a new one. Sometimes things come out of nowhere that change your life. I like to think if you're creative, you can make something out of that. Maybe even make something better. Some forms of darkness you have to escape. You have to get out. But some you have to see where you are and turn on a light. Try to help the other people in there find each other. There's something beautiful to the darkness. And I think if I focus on that, I can make myself at home here for a little while. Sometimes you get lost in it. Don't forget you're not out of this yet. It's not as simple as that. These are the same walls you almost didn't escape the first time. enjoyed this episode of Out of the Ether with Brandon Hardy. Now that I've finally gotten started, I can't wait to share with you all the projects I have in mind to keep building. I will be diving quickly into Halloween, but I plan to continue beyond that, showing you all different kinds of projects and techniques. Lots of secrets yet to be revealed. See you soon. <laughs>